and we're about to start the recording. So, hello everyone um, and welcome. We are recording this session with transcripts and it will also be uploaded to YouTube afterwards. Um, if you don't want to be on video, you do not have to, so please feel free to turn your cameras off now. Um, and we're going to pin the speakers um, so that they are able to be highlighted on your screens. So, without further ado, welcome. Welcome to this wonderful June um, session for the Fireside Chat hosted by The Turing Way. My name is Sophia Batchelor. I'm a core contributor to The Turing Way and also part of the Accessibility Working Group. Um, I want to go for, first through a little bit of housekeeping and general information about this call before passing the mic to our wonderful chairs, Liz here and Tanya Allard, who will be joined by Lynn Kiribo. So to get us started, a few words about the Turing Way itself. Um, it is an open source, open collaboration and community developed handbook on data science. The goal of the book and our goal as a community is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative data science possible um, and to make it accessible and comprehensible for a really wide and diverse audience. Although I am kicking the session off today, I'm part of a much wider team that works to include and engage patients and members of the public in AI and data science health research. And so much of the guidance in the Turing Way and its wonderful community have helped to shape the way in which we talk about collaboration in data science and data science research. So I'm so excited uh, for the discussion that will happen today. The Turing Way itself is hosted by, but of course not exclusive to, the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Centre for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Our project within the Turing Way is, logic, is located within the Tools, Practices and Systems Programme, which we will link in the chat in just a moment. This TPS, Tools, Practices and Systems, program helps to strategize and implement open infrastructure within the Institute across varying areas of research within the Turing and also nationally across the UK. These fireside chats that the Turing Way hosts itself has been a really um, big effort towards creating a space across open science communities and indeed the wider open ecosystem where people can gather, exchange concerns, share ideas, explore challenges and different practices that work within their own projects and within their own communities uh, to build allyship and understand one another's work and the perspectives that we all have just a little bit better. With that being said, I'm so excited about this month's topic and discussion on making things accessible within data science. The topic and discussion will be introduced by Liz here in just a moment. So before we get started, the final piece of housekeeping, please note that we have a shared etherpad to facilitate written note taking and invite ideas from you as the audience who have all joined to listen into this wonderful discussion. Please feel free to add questions, um, contribute to the notes and either the pad or the chat and we will be monitoring it as we go through and we'll make sure to post them after as well. We do have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. For any concerns, um, reporting of an incident uh, of anything that makes you feel uncomfortable on this call, or if you have further ideas to improve accessibility, please email theturingway at gmail.com. That link, will, that address will be posted in the chat as I know my accent does butcher some things. Um, you can also directly reach out to me, Sophia, or Malvika Sharan, the senior researcher uh, with the Turing Way who opened the call and set up the Zoom room um, by emailing either of us directly. There is a lot more information about this process that is in the shared etherpad um, if you would like to refer to it. And just a final rem a reminder, we will be hosting uh, this Zoom call a little bit longer beyond the discussion um, for an open and unrecorded uh, conversation. It is completely optional to uh, stay and take part in this. Um, and as when, of course, we will turn off the recording and stop uploading to YouTube, but we'll give everyone an opportunity to ask questions to one another and also to reflect ourselves um, in perhaps a, a less formal um, setting than the start of this wonderful fireside chat. And um, it leads to some really wonderful conversations. So with all of that, 
I'm really, truly delighted to hand over to Liz um, and the co-host for today's session, Tanya Allard, uh, to kick off today's fireside chat. Thank you so much, Sophia. I am really happy to be here with some of my great colleagues from the Turing Way. Um, I also have been uh, a member of the Accessibility Working Group where we have been working across the community, not just for the accessibility of the book itself, but for all the processes and tools that we use uh, to communicate with each other and, and work together. Um, one of the activities of the Accessibility Working Group has been to draft an accessibility policy for the Touring Way as an organization. And we are defining accessibility very broadly. Um, it's often defined just in terms of disability access. However, um, we want to reach additional groups of people who have accessibility barriers to uh, events and uh, events and and other other. Uh, co-working spaces and tools. Um, so we are also interested in um, removing barriers for people who may have uh, child or elder care responsibilities, people who may be joining from the Global South where there may be limited uh, bandwidth or uh, computational power. Um, and uh, uh, people with neurodivergence, and uh, you know, not not limited. We we want to be open to learning about at barriers and figuring out what we can do to mitigate them, with the goal that people don't have to ask in advance for accessibility or disclose a disability or uh, set it up themselves. Um, and with that, I would like to continue with our introductions, and I'm going to ask our co-facilitator, Tanya, to introduce herself, and then maybe we can have Lynchirabo after that. Oh, thank you very much, Liz. Um, hi, my name is Tanya Allard. My pronouns are she, her, and well, I've been participating in the Turing way for a while now. I think I've been a uh, true witness of like how much it's grown, like how much, how many people it's reached in the community, how the community has extended. Um, I have been working now for quite a while, mostly in accessibility, in the context of open source and scientific software. Um, with a main focus on building accessible tools or like getting, um, sorry, achieving uh, disability justice and disability visibility within the scientific computing and open source ecosystems, as well as also been thinking a lot as a maintainer and someone that um, is a director of an open source lab, how we can really live up to the standards of open source and open source communities and ensuring equitable access to everyone. And like Liz very rightly so mentioned, this broadens to uh, many, many branches of uh, access and access technical barriers and social technical barriers and attitudinal barriers. So I think about this a lot, pretty much every day. And I think we can um introduce our speakers is that right uh, our, um we have lynn carabo joining us today so lynn would you like to introduce yourself sure um thank you both uh, my name is lynn carabo and this is my first interaction with the turing way so i'm pretty excited to um, participate um and also if y'all can't hear me for any reason or can't see me um just like put it in the chat and I'll try to troubleshoot on my end. Um, so I am uh, an assistant professor of climate and computer science out at Harvey Mudd College. Um, I, I do research at the intersection of human computer interaction and accessibility. Um, and so um, 
spent a couple of years trying to understand how we can make um, the future of public transit interfaces more accessible. Um, and the majority of the time I was working with um, disabled populations in um, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, as well as in um, uh, two urban cities in East Africa. So that's Kampala, Uganda and um, uh, Kigali, Rwanda. Um, <clears throat> And um, more recently, I've been also interested in the intersection of um, uh, uh, climate resilience and, um, and disability and trying to understand what are some of the lived experiences that, um, uh, that are happening that uh, are not really documented or taken into, into consideration when developing um, uh, climate technologies. Um, I consider myself a cousin to the data science community. Um, I think that's how I like to describe myself when I'm in the data science space. Um, and yeah, I am really excited to be here. And I'll just say a little bit more about myself. Hello. I forgot my pronouns, which are she, her. Um, I am blind and so I am coming at this from both um, trying to create access for myself and trying to create access to, uh, for, for, you know, all, all kinds of other barriers. Um, I started to get involved a little bit before COVID in, in the R community with the R conferences. Um, they were, uh, back when Twitter was, was actually Twitter and had, uh, both kind of data science and disability communities. Um, they were conducting a survey about the, the previous use our conference. And I kind of said, you know, those are really accessible, in, inaccessible to a lot of people. Um, and so I joined Forwards, which is the R task force. Uh, and in 2021, we, we had a really innovative online conference um, which unfortunately the, the, some of the innovations have been lost in subsequent years, which is, which is pretty disappointing. Um, but, uh, I, I then joined the Turing way because the Turing way was, was really interested in, uh, accessibility as, as far as, uh, how to, how to, you know, change the processes and, and things like that. So we've written things like, you know, a, a guide for using Slack in a way that that your posts will be accessible to all kinds of people and and things like that um and i'm going to turn it over to tanya to ask the next question thank you liz um so we'd like to start this discussion with oh sorry uh for work that i am losing my sorry there you go um so for the work that open science community does, whether it is an event or projects, what information do you need to fully participate? Um, Lynn, would you be able to share some thoughts there? Um, what information would I need to fully participate? Yes. You can also frame oh. that as uh, what, what, when you organize things, what do you think is important to to include for accessibility? Yeah. Um, so I think there there's a couple of things, right? So the way I, I like the broad definition of accessibility that well we have all talked um, talked about. Um, I think one of one of the things is is understanding that we are that you might have a super global audience. And so people um, calling in from multiple locations. And so having easy easy access to um, uh, just things as simple as um, what time it's going to start, right? Um, or um, yeah, yeah, time zone conversions are something that um, uh, that is super important now that we have access to um, uh, platforms like, um, like Zoom. Um, I think also considering um, uh, paywalls, right? So um, when uh, disseminating research, for instance, um, some journals are not accessible to some of the populations that we might work with. 
Um, so trying to understand, okay, so how can I still make this accessible to the people who have contributed to this research um, or even who want to participate in some events? Some events you do have to, um, uh, you know, make a contribution of some sort. Um, um, yeah, I, I think for now, those are some of the things that I think about when, um, uh, yeah, I think for now that's what I'm thinking about. Maybe I'll I'll jump in again um, uh, as as we go on with this question. For me, as a person who's blind, uh, when I'm considering uh, signing up for a conference or a co-working space or a hackathon, I am hoping to find information on the website about what steps they are taking uh, for accessibility. Um, I would like to find out if I will be able to download the slides because when they're shown, for example, as a screen share on Zoom, that's not accessible with a screen reader at all. There's no, there's no technology for reading video. Um, in addition to having the slides in advance, um, I, I'd like to know that they are going to use some kind of text description for grant uh, graphs and charts and photos. Um, because if you miss the graph that's the main point of the talk, you kind of miss a lot. Um, sometimes you can get that from, from the person speaking about their uh, presentation, but often information is left out. You can really, the information comes on two channels, seeing and hearing, and they really complement each other in a lot of ways and, and are not complete in themselves. Um, I also am concerned with what conference platform the event will be on. Many of them are not screen reader accessible. Some of them were visual point and click interface things like gather town and easy chair and, and things like that are, are not accessible at all. Uh, I wouldn't be able to join at all. So um, Zoom is in wide use. They pay attention to accessibility. Um, while it's sometimes a little bit hard to navigate, it is uh, very familiar to a lot of people. So um, I think things like familiarity really also help with accessibility on many, many levels when you're talking about people who may have cognitive disabilities or um, you know limited time or need to use a mobile phone to interact. Um, so so those are those are some more general uh, concerns. Um, and I will ask Tanya. I well, I think it really depends, for example, for me, depending on whether it is an online event or an in-person event, I, I will have similar but slightly different requirements. I think um, something that really, really helps me is having a being able to see the schedule or plans, whether it is traveling plans or joining plans or schedule or topics that are going to be covered well in advance so I can plan around that. That definitely helps me to just organize myself and also as someone that can experience sensory overload and um, have to deal with varying levels of energy, like having that information well in advance help me prepare, making sure that I um, allocate time for rest, allocate time for decompression, that I know where I am expected to be at what time. That really, really helps and support myself. I think also for events that are in person and require traveling um, visas, like I really, really consider places that where I have to travel and will require visas because that really, really limits the access of participation or like people that can be present at that event. Um, so and I think also one of the, the best things that came out of us having to move to a remote environment during the pandemic was the prevalence or the emergence of online conferences. I think that was one of the best things that or outcomes that could have happened for the disabled community and like folks that especially are located in the global south or that are not able to travel because life conditions 
uh, carrying responsibilities and such. And I think that like being able to be present without having to worry about all of those travel constraints, like um, having to massively disrupt your routine um, is something that I appreciated very much. And I still appreciate seeing conferences and events that were really, really, really hard to have hybrid events or an online events to reach out to the global community. That's a really good point. And I'd also like to add that it's also a financial um with financial impacts often people who have come from a marginalized platform haven't had as many career opportunities and things like that to have um you know just to have the funds to be able to travel to in-person conferences is kind of a privilege and online um really kind of flattens the power structure and lets more people participate Um, and, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Liz. I was just going to jump on the next question. Um, so since we're talking about, well, what requirements or what things do we look, accessibility considerations, what are some of the accessibility barriers that you have seen or experienced in communities like the Turing Way or other open science communities uh, that you've participated or tried to participate? Do you want to take that one first or do you want me to? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so I think some of the barriers that I have seen is um, sometimes some of the methods that we use when we're doing research. So I will speak from a research perspective um, because that's where um, that's where I'm situated right now. Um, and also I should say I, um, I try to use identity first um, uh, identity-based language um, when describing um, disabled populations. Um, okay, so um, some of the barriers that I have seen um, specifically with regard to disability is that some of the methods that um, uh, that folks use, um, these are traditional methods, these are methods that have been taught in classrooms that have been passed down through um, for, for, for the years that some of these fields have been around, some of these methods are not accessible. Um, they assume a lot of things about populations that are um, that are not true, right? And um, for some reason, um, there is a bit of resistance that, that the community uh, pushes back when you as a researcher try to make, um, try to tweak these methods and try to change them and make them more, um, more um, accessible. Um, and so I think that's a barrier that is seen on both sides for researchers who are interested in accessibility, but also for populations who have, um, who participate in some of these studies and then um, uh, feel frustration because of um, the methods that are used, right? And so that's the first one. Um, I think um, as well, like, um, when, when again, doing research, um, there are uh, forms of payment that are popular, uh, forms of um, payment for participants. So things like gift cards are very Western centric, um, whereas, you know, an Amazon gift card is not going to help me if I'm in a popular, in a location where um, it means nothing to me. I mean, it's fancy, but that's as far as it goes, right? And so considering um, your context, the context where your population is and what forms of, um, um, I know payment's not the right word. I feel like there's another word for this that is, I'm completely blanking on. Um, but, you know, like uh, for some of my research populations, um, mobile money is a much better form of, um, um, of, of paying them, right? So yeah, so, so those are some of the two things I've seen with regard to um, uh, disabled, working with disabled populations, but also um, working with Global South populations, like, um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely, that's true. Um, even as a privileged Western white woman, I really don't like gift cards. Um, 
if you are going to compensate me for my expertise, then please do it with something that I can use however I want. Um, it, it really feels, uh, being given a, a gift card, just see, it seems sort of diminishing. It, it, it's, it's not flexible in the way that I, uh, can use. And it, it just seems like, uh, they picked something because it's, it's easy to buy a gift card on your credit card and it's harder to maybe do, uh, you know, actually pay someone cash, but, um, people with disabilities who participate in these things are are actually experts and it's important to recognize that and i will let tanya go next on this question about accessibility barriers that you have found for yourself i think like uh, i i very much agree with it, all of this i think coming from an open source perspective and having spent so much of my time there i've like very much uh, have also seen a lot of that resistance to mm -hmm. change also in a research context, even when someone comes and like makes a proposal to make research more open or a tool more accessible or something work better to better serve a community. Um, initially, there can be a lot of resistance in changing processes and tools and adopting practices that add at first sight doesn't seem do not seem convenient uh, for people that are not disabled or are very privileged. I think that is one of the biggest barriers of participation that I've seen. And like that eventually ends up growing a lot of people that really care about accessibility, that really care about access because they are not empowered and supported to enact this change. Um I think also because we have a practice of heavily relying on volunteer labor and volunteering. We place, well, a lot of open source software and infrastructure places a lot of uh, labor and load on disabled people to advocate for themselves, to do work that should be paid, that should be uh, remunerated and uh, expect that they will raise these issues, fix it themselves uh, for free, or that they will volunteer at their time uh, to help build the product. And that that has huge, huge barriers. Well, that, that imposes a big amount of barriers. Um, also, and this is um, a very personal thing, I think there is still a lot of ableism when it comes to invisible disabilities. Uh, people find it so much easier to be empathetic when someone has a visible disability and try and make accommodations and make adjustments for their for them. But cognitive disabilities can very easily be dismissed or other type of invisible disabilities just because, um, well, they're invisible. And sometimes we are put in a position where we're asked to demonstrate that we have a disability to justify why we're asking for certain accommodations. Uh, I think that is a big, big barrier that I have experienced myself in certain contexts. That's great. Um, I think one thing that we can do in our communities is try to eliminate the need for people to even ask for accessibility. Um, you know, uh, invisible disabilities are, are a really important consideration. Um, Disclosure is a really important consideration. Some people just really, really aren't comfortable sharing, you know, that they can't see or hear well, or or that they have a personal situation in their life where they are only, you know, available at certain times of day or or something like that. Um, so I think it's really important for organizations to. You know, if, if you have a meeting or you have a shared workspace to really have uh, your policies and, and lay out, um, you know, what what accessibility practices do we do and what can you expect to be there? Because then then people can enter without barriers. I do agree. I agree. Like being 
if possible, being forthcoming about what you can offer in terms of accessibility and accommodation goes a long way because that removes a lot of anxiety for folks. Like some folks are not openly disabled or well, are not very open about their disability um, because of many reasons, because of ableism, because they can lose some opportunities or just because they are exercising their right to maintain their personal information private. Um, so if us as an organization or a community are forthcoming about what we are doing and how we're thinking about accessibility, that helps our community, that enables that enables folks in our community to participate more openly. And also if there is an accommodation that they need and it's not listed there, it also gives folks more confidence that if they request an accommodation or some support that they will be listened to and supported instead of being dismissed. Yeah, I think um, there's two other things that I wanted to um, kind of add to this conversation. Um, I think there's also, if some of these, some of our communities could understand the unfair burden or the unfair labor that it, it puts on, um, um, on people who need accommodations to, um, to have to self-disclose, right? Like you're talking about, and I think it would it would um, it would it would make I think it would make life a little more easier, right? So if if you if you saw if if your community insists on people self-disclosing, um, and a way to look at that is you're putting an unfair burden on this community, and whether that is um, something from you know. Um, a, a accommodation because of a disability, whether it's a, a visible disability or an invisible one, um, I think we can set, we can make people realize that or help people realize um, that it's it's really an unfair burden um, that the people it people assume that others should take on. Like if if you need an accommodation, ask for one. It's 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 a little unfair. Um, and then the other thing is. Um, Oh God, I think it's just just gone out of unconscious bias. Um, when you when you're dealing with communities that are from that that are coming from everywhere, I think we all should accept and be a little bit humble that we are approaching um, some of these situations with our own unconscious bias. Whether this is bias about someone's skill or someone's ability, because um, I think one of the first steps is to admit that hey, you know, I do not know. Um, I do not know what you need, right? And so um, I, I, a perfect example is like populations that come from the global South. There are times when you interact with people and they just make assumptions based on, um, you know, their own background and their own exposure to people who are coming from specific countries. And they make assumptions based on, uh, you know, level of contribution, quality, and I'm putting quality in quotes of contribution, right? And again, the unfair burden on these people to then have to come back and say, hey, um, you know, what you're doing is making me feel unsafe or what you're doing is making me um, either not want to participate at all uh, and disengage completely, or um, what you're doing is, is just, it's making this a really toxic environment. And so realizing that the places that we've, we, we have grown up and the the communities that we've surrounded ourselves with do have an influence or an impact in how we perceive the world. And because of that, we are um, predisposed to certain types of unconscious biases. Those are really great points. And um, I think a quick thing to mention might be internalized ableism. So, um, because people with disabilities live uh, usually among lots of people without disabilities, the, the ableism even creeps into our own heads. Uh, and so when we are asking for accommodations, we're, we have this internal tension between, um, I belong at this conference no matter what, and I need to have someone describe the graphs but if I draw attention to that, 
they're going to think I'm not conf confident to be there or something. Um, so uh, ableism is not just a non-disabled people thing. It's it's a disabled people thing too. I I I I do agree there, Liz, and I think a lot of uh, I don't know if uh, you folks or if folks in the audience are familiar with the term of death by thousand cuts. I think like that is an experience, a short experience by many folks with disabilities, where you are faced so many times with small barriers or the same fights over over time then that places that, that definitely impacts how you can participate how to interact with the community with the environment and it also can significantly modify your, perce your perception of self um and affect like have other detrimental impacts in mental health as well and lead to also um continuation or perpetuation of internalized ableism. So the the more we can do as a collective to, as I said before, or we've been saying for being forthcoming and thinking who is our audience, who is our community, what do they need from us to be able to participate and um, to be included, whether it is in an online room or in a physical space, um, the more we do that work ourselves up front, the easier we're making also this participation for them, um, for, for all of our community, or for us. Are we ready for the next question? Yes, okay. go for it. Um, how can organizations remove barriers to participation so that people don't have to do this disclosure? Um, and even even on a personal level, um, you know, how can how can people because one of the important things about uh, the Turing Ways uh, policy on accessibility, which which comes from Andrea Sanchez Tapia, is that it's not just technical steps that we take, but it's also social steps that we take. So what kinds of things can organizations or individuals do to kind of be seamlessly inclusive? Um, I think one of, one of the ways that I've been looking at this is to learn from others. Um, I think there are some people, especially in my field, so human computer interaction and accessibility that are already doing a really good job, are already, do already have um, these practices written down, do already have um, um, measures and structures um, and, you know, detailed outlines or guidelines on how to be, um, how to be more inclusive, how to be accessible, um, and and learning from them, right? I think I think there is, if people are, if some communities are already doing it well, then I think there's no use reinventing the wheel, right? I think learning from each other, even um, within the broader software engineering, computer science umbrella, I think if there are subdomains within these fields that are already doing a good job, then learning from each other um, is important. And this can be through um, uh, collaborations, it can be through um, you know, going for talks that people are hosting. Um, uh, yeah, and I think also, um, uh, again, I'm speaking more from the academic standpoint, um, volunteering to um, uh, be part of, you know, the accessibility committees um, that some of these conferences now have um, so that you either are ensuring that your voice is heard or you are going to learn as well to learn um, how different people are doing things or how um, the conference is trying to make sure that it is um, inclusive, whether it is physical or online or or hybrid. Um, 
Um, I think, yeah, so those are the two main ones. So trying to understand what is already being done and, you know, how, who are the people who are doing it well? Um, and then also um, volunteering in some of these spaces. Um, yeah. Tanya? Um, well, I think I, I think that, let me think, let me organize my thoughts. Uh, a very good step is recognizing that access and accessibility is not an end goal. It's not something that is all ever going to be completed or you're going to get to a point and say, here, I draw a line and there is no way I can be more accessible or more inclusive. Um, but it's an iterative approach and there are always going to be ways in which you can continue to improve. So with that mindset, is, is focusing on iter iteration, whether it is starting with implementing something, change your policies or improve your processes, and then collect feedback, listen to the folks that benefit from those from those accommodations or from those policies or are not being benefited by those policies and iterate, continue iterating, looking like Lynn already mentioned, to what other folks are doing, to what other folks are doing well. Uh, and recognize that sometimes you're gonna make mistakes and that's okay. Um, we're all learning here, but trying to hide when you make mistakes and blame it on others is what is harmful. Recognizing that we're all learning and this is an iterative process and you're going to have to continue working on that already puts organizations in, in a path to success. Those are really good points. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add on that. Okay, um, how do we have five, eight minutes left if I go correctly by my time? Shall we check if we have, um, do we have any questions from folks that are joining on Zoom or do we have, um, do we want to share any final remarks here, Liz, Lynn? Uh, uh, yeah. We'll go Lynn to you and then there are some questions that we have from the frame of head that I can jump in on, but Lynn, you first. Okay, um, I really like what you said, Tanya, about it being an iterative process. Um, and, you know, like we're going to make mistakes, but acknowledging that a mistake has happened and um, growing from it and constantly um, with your eye towards how can we continue this process? I think I that's my main takeaway from this session. And I really like that. Um, and I think also just not being afraid to critique and um, critique and offer subtle changes to some of these methods that have been, you know, ingrained in, in, in either research or practice fields, right? I think as people who are committed to this process, I think we come with a perspective that is helpful and beneficial to the community. And so being courageous enough to say, hey, you know, this thing that we've been doing, it's it's not great for X, Y, and Z populations as researchers. Can we work towards changing it and making it look like this? Right? I think, I think would be would be helpful, you know, to those iterations that you were talking about. I would also encourage people who are organizing things to just ask about accessibility. Um, you know, it, it's, it really surprises me how many times I say, you know, I, I wanna come to this event and I will be happy to work with you on organizing this event so that it's accessible to me. I shouldn't have to, but I do. And it's really surprising how I then don't get involved in planning things or answering questions about what's accessible and how it works. So, um, you know, I think finding someone who has, um, you know, has the lived experience to, uh, you know, help you troubleshoot and and 
to make suggestions about accessibility practices is something that you should feel like like you can do. Um, I know there's always a lot of time constraints when people are planning events and stuff, but and accessibility is often the thing that kind of kind of gets lost. Um, and uh, just to switch gears a little bit before we start taking questions, I really want to thank everybody at the Turing Way uh, for having a, a commitment to um, both um, being flexible and learning about uh, using tools that are more accessible um, and also talking about it a whole lot. Um, and I want to shout out to Ann Steele, who couldn't be here today, but um, she has been a great kind of uh, organizer and logistical person, but also we've had a lot of really, really great, uh, really great conversations about accessibility and how we want our community to be. Um, and we have with the Turing Way provides us a great opportunity to to be a reference and to to organize knowledge about accessibility so that other people don't have to uh, don't have to as Lynn was talking about don't don't have to do it from scratch. Um, so thanks everybody. Also amazing. So um, you know, I would like to to thank all of our speakers and also all of you today. We will switch to the the unrecorded discussion uh, to answer some of those questions. But if you do want to um, look at the answers to some of these questions and you do have to drop off the call right now, um, please feel free to refer to the Etherpad. Um, again, thank a massive and huge thank you to all of you for joining in today. Um, if you would like to suggest another topic for a future fireside chat, um, please feel free to um, get in contact. Again, the email is theturingway um, at gmail.com, or you can write them um, in the etherpad. Feel free to reach out to the community on Slack as well if you would like to um, co-sponsor the next fireside chat with us. Uh, so this event has been sponsored by the Research Software Engineering um, RSC community as well as the Turing Way. Um, a huge thanks to again uh, Anne Lee Steele who Liz just mentioned as well as Liz and Tanya um, for really leading the discussion on these topics today and a huge thank you to Lynn um, for sharing all of her expertise and knowledge with us. Um, it's been fantastic um, what we've kind of covered and captured here today. Um, so we will be leaving this Zoom room um, open for the next 30 minutes. Um, if you'd like to stick around, have these questions.